All right, it is 6 o'clock. We will call this meeting to order. 6.30. 6.30, 6 o'clock. <laughs> Been a long day. <laughs> um, so I'm excited that we finally have a full contingent of new commissioners. We're missing, we've got everyone except we're missing Mark and Tom tonight. So, uh, but we have a full slate, which is exciting, which we haven't had for a while. So um, I was debating as we came here, um, I, I think it would obviously would be great to kind of do some introductions and, and do that. The question is, I'll look to Mike as well, do we want to do that now and feel rushed through it, or do we want to push through the hearing and then then we'll have we can do that in a more relaxed manner? What what's the preference of everyone here? Okay. Push through it. Yeah, my yeah. vote is we just jump in. You know, I, I will say to the new folks that uh, we have had the benefit of at least one work session around the agenda tonight. So a uh, few of us have a little bit of an advantage. Um, We've all been where you are. Um, there will be a learning curve here to some extent, and but at any point, just feel free to say, where are we, what's the process, ask lots of questions, um, we're here to help. So welcome aboard, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, I guess I have to read the official script that I've been provided since <laughs> this is a public hearing, uh, so folks would bear with me. Um, we are opening a public hearing for ZDO 268. Uh, the public hearing is now open uh, for a legislative proposal to amend the Clackamas County Zoning and Development Ordinance and Comprehensive Plan. Uh, the Planning Commission is charged with making a recommendation on the application to the Board of County Commissioners. The record for this hearing will be forwarded to the, to the Board, which will make the final decision on this matter. The board will conduct another hearing on this application on August 15th, 2018 at 9.30 a.m. That hearing will be de novo, meaning that the hearing will be started anew and an additional, an additional testimony may be offered. Tonight's hearing will not go beyond 10 p.m. If not concluded, it will be continued to a date and time certain. The hearing may be continued for other reasons as well. If an announcement of an additional hearing date and time is made tonight, it will be the only notice given of this additional hearing. I don't think that's going to be an issue. Uh, conduct of the hearing. The public hearing will be conducted as follows. Uh, first, the Planning and Zoning Division uh, will give a staff report. Uh, we will enter into the record any additional correspondence received. Technical information from other gover government agencies will be received. Uh, we will receive testimony from representatives of recognized community planning organiz organizations, hamlets, and villages. Um, testimony by any other person. Uh, and then closing of the public hearing. Uh, and then finally, the Planning Commission will lead to discussion and action. So that's the introduction. We have nobody in the audience. Uh, usually we start these, these uh, hearings with an opportunity for people to testify on things that are not on our agenda. Um, so that's obviously not an issue here because we have nobody in the audience and just the staff. Uh, and so we will go right into the staff report. Take it away, Jennifer. Okay. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Hughes from the Planning and Zoning Division. This is my colleague, Martha Fritzi, to my left. Um, I'll be doing the bulk of the staff presentation, but Martha is here as the expert on the proposal related to changes to our solar access standards. And so when we get to that part of the presentation, she'll take over. And then if you've got questions about that, um, she's here as a resource. Um, I feel like I should apologize for this PowerPoint to the people who've been here for a while because you've seen several of these slides multiple times. And I was going to delete them, and then I thought, no, we have um, new commissioners tonight, and it would be good to give just a little bit of that background. So what you're considering tonight is a legislative text amendment to the Clackamas County Zoning and Development Ordinance uh, related to the county's audit of the ZDO. So what is the ZDO? The ZDO regulates zoning and development in unincorporated Clackamas County. It implements the goals and policies of the county's comprehensive plan. The ZDO in its current form was adopted in 1980, and it's been amended more than 200 times in the intervening years. So the result of, as you can imagine, that many years passing, that many changes being made, is that you start to develop some inconsistencies, um, some places where you know things conflict with one another, where it starts to be difficult to use the code, where it has grown to perhaps an unmanageable length. So the decision was made um, back in 2012 to start a process to, quote, audit the code and essentially try to clean it up from beginning to end. 
and so what is an audit? So we are reviewing the county's ZDO to streamline and clarify, to repeal redundant or conflicting regulations, uh, to reorganize the code, to make information easier to find and easier to understand, to ensure consistency with state and regional laws, and in some cases to consider amendments to policies on uses and development standards. So there are some substantive things that have happened as a result of the audit up to now, and I would expect that that will uh, continue to be the case as we work through the remaining phases. But primarily the goal has been what I would describe as housekeeping, rather than wholesale changes in the county's direction with regard to land use. Whoops. So the schedule, um, just by way of background, initially the idea was to complete the audit in five years. Mm -hmm. We um, actually stopped working on the audit for a period of time, and you'll see that on this schedule here. So as a result, we actually expect that it will take about seven years from beginning to end um, because of that time that we stopped working on it. So phase one, we started with the industrial zones and we worked on the sections of the code that pertain to the county's industrial zones. That was back in 2012, 2013, that fiscal year. Then moved on to urban, residential, and commercial zones and to our procedural standards. So the things that talk about what kind of notice we send out, uh, what kind of hearings we hold, what, what the planning commission does. Um, maybe not the most exciting part of the code, but definitely essential. Then in the third year, uh, we switched to rural, so rural residential and commercial zoning districts, our development review process and discretionary permits. So things like subdivisions, design review, temporary permits, conditional use permits, the criteria, the submittal requirements for those types of permits uh, were dealt with in that phase. Then what the intent was, was to move into our exceptions provisions, our development standards, which are everything from landscaping to parking standards, to building design, to signs, all the things that sort of control the way things look and function on a site. Uh, and our special, was originally supposed to include our special use requirements as well, which we're gonna talk about tonight. As you can see, it was suspended. The county um, was uh, needing to direct significant resources to some other things that came about, including the adoption of regulations to uh, deal with the legalization of marijuana, um, some provisions we needed to do to deal with the disincorporation of Damascus, and so we stopped, took care of those things, and then came back to the audit in the fiscal year that just ended June 30th. And so that bold, that's where we are now, the bolded line there. Um, special use requirements, exceptions, and development standards. And we tackled that in two phases. So the first phase was actually before the Planning Commission in February. Uh, that is complete and has taken effect. And the second phase is what you're hearing tonight. And then we, our work program for the fiscal year that started July 1st includes what we hope will be the final two phases of the audit, uh, which are the remaining development. There's still about a half a dozen development standard sections that need to be audited our overlay zones, so that's everything from the floodplain management district to airport overlays to our historic landmark provisions and a number of other overlay zones. And a cleanup of our definition section, we've been doing that a little bit along the way, but it needs to kind of be gone over from beginning to end and just final organization of the code, looking at whether we're gonna renumber it, put you know, sections maybe in a more logical order, uh, that kind of thing. So this is phase five of the envisioned seven phases. So sort of big picture phase five, there are 60 sections of the ZDO, that's why your packets are so large, uh, that are proposed for amendment as part of this, seven of which are actually proposed to be repealed. Of those, about half um, are only proposed for what I would describe as conforming amendments. They're fairly minor changes, largely in order to be consistent with something we're proposing in a different section and about half of them are somewhat more substantive. Um, although again, with this particular phase of the audit, um, the vast majority of the changes fall squarely in the housekeeping category. So we are continuing to reorganize the code for clarity and ease of use, just moving things around to where they more logically are grouped with similar provisions. To continue, continue to consolidate permitted uses, we um, piloted these tables of uses back in phase one. Previously, our code was just lists of text about what uses were allowed in our 50 some odd zoning districts. And we've converted that to tables now, which while they're still not perfect, are much easier to use than what we had before. I keep thinking I've found all the uses buried in the code. And then again, this time I did find one or two things that needed to be moved from where they were into those tables. 
Uh, continuing to amend for consistency with state law. For instance, in this round, uh, we needed to make some changes to our manufactured dwelling and manufactured dwelling park standards that are inconsistent with uh, limitations that are in state law. So that's an example of the kind of thing that, that we've been doing throughout this process. Um, and then just generally streamlining the ZDO by repealing things that are really obsolete or redundant. And generally that's because either there's some other regulatory authority that has kind of has control and we're not really adding any value with regard to that. For instance, our surface water management regulations that we repealed a lot of those in the last phase because there are now surface water management authorities that have their own regulations that were kind of on top of ours and we had never really recognized that, you know, that reality over the years. Um, or they're obsolete because as those 200 some odd amendments have happened, we've maybe adopted screening provisions somewhere else in the code and forgot to take them out of the eight other locations where they were. And so the idea is we don't need these conflicting provisions. One set of standards for how you screen things should be sufficient and you know, kind of standardized approach to how those things are applied. So more specifically uh, with regard to this proposal, um, and again, as I said, and I think if you read the, you know, I know you read the summaries that came out, you'll realize that a lot of what we're doing is, um, is really housekeeping. But I tried to pull out some of the things that had at least somewhat more of a, you know, substantive um, bent to them than just being cleanup. So we are proposing to amend our definition of guest house. Um, and it's interesting because I know you all just had your discussion about accessory dwelling units at your previous hearing. And so um, in the world of accessory dwelling, we, now we have accessory dwelling units. When our guest house provisions were first adopted many years ago, there were no accessory dwelling units. And so guest houses seem to have a lot more utility than they maybe do today. Um, but still, in, in some zones where you can't do an ADU, um, a guest house is still something that seems, um, you know, something that folks um, would like to potentially have. And so we thought we would update our standards really to reflect what has been um, kind of a policy to address some unclear areas of the code. And so the idea is we permit on a fairly regular basis accessory structures to people's dwellings that are habitable space, meaning that the, under the building code, they're not just storage, they're not just a garage, but they in fact are habitable space. You could have a rec room or a home office or an art studio. And um, those have routinely for decades uh, been approved without having to be subject to the guest house standards. But the guest house regulations are a little unclear about you know, in our, in our minds, sort of a guest house slash studio meant something more, a living space, like you would sleep there, in other words. And so the idea is to make that very clear, that when we're talking about a guest house, we're talking about a place that has sleeping space and it's built a habitable code, and then therefore it's subject to the limitations that are identified in Section 833. So that's kind of the heart of the, the proposed change there. It's still the case that guest houses can't be rented. They're lived in by members of the family who reside in the primary dwelling or their non-paying guests or their employees. So for instance, if you had to live in nanny, they could live in a guest house. Um, the other thing I should point out is that we're proposing to strike, there is some language now that says that guest houses are temporary living space. That has caused problems over the years because we don't really know what temporary means. There was no time limit placed. Uh, it's caused, I actually spoke with our code enforcement staff, actually just today, um, to confirm that yes, in fact, that would be helpful to them if we removed that because they also don't really know what temporary is and it's caused problems over the years. So essentially there would be no attempt to tell people how many nights a year someone could sleep in the guest house. It just can't have cooking facilities and it can't be rented. Other than that, and then there's a 600 square foot size limitation, that's not a change. It's gotta be within 100 feet of the house, that's also not a change. So there are limitations, but there would not be something saying you can only be there temporarily. So just wanna point that out. Uh, we would be proposing to allow bus shelters in the uh, regional center high density residential zone. That's the only zone for some reason right now that doesn't allow bus shelters. I'm not, I don't believe that was intentional. I think it was an oversight. So we'd be adding that as an accessory use. We talked at your study session last time, or two meetings ago, but the study session on this proposal um, about revising the front setback for places of worship, and the commission was in favor of that. Right now, there's a 30-foot front yard setback um, in any zone that's subject to Section 804, which regulates churches. And that's a larger front yard setback than is required, um, for instance, in urban residential zones. And so the thinking was, well, would it be a bad thing for a church to be able to be pulled closer to the street? 
and it's a conditional use in those zones, so you can always require a greater setback if it's necessary to mitigate the impacts. So the package does include that proposal to remove that special setback. In rural areas, typically the front setback is still 30 feet anyway, for even for homes, but in the urban area it would provide some flexibility. <coughs> We're proposing to repeal, there are for certain uses, uh, places of worship, schools, transfer stations, um, some special minimum lot sizes only in these two zones, Hoodland Residential and Recreational Residential. Uh, we don't really know why. I, I think it's probably just a relic from back when the Mount Hood plan was first adopted, um, but there really isn't any identified rationale why those would be, would be different than any other residential district. These uses are conditional uses, meaning that the site always has to be evaluated for suitability, which includes size. So if they propose to put something on a site that was unreasonably small, you know, the permit could be denied, but there wouldn't be a hard and fast minimum anymore uh, for those handful of uses. Continuing with some specifics, um, I mentioned that we're proposing to repeal some sections. Six of the sections proposed for repeal are in our 800 series, um, all of which deal with certain special or specific uses. So the proposal is to repeal the sections for daycare facilities, hospitals, nursing homes, drive-in theaters, bus shelters, and hydroelectric facilities. With the exception of the drive-in theaters section, um, all of those sections, the provisions in staff's opinion just don't really add value over the other things that we have that regulate these uses. So. Depending upon the zone that we're talking about, these are either conditional use permits where they go through a public hearing, where they're subject to all of the dis discretionary siting standards for a conditional use, or they're subject to design review or both. And in design review, you're looking at as a, you know, parking, landscaping, um, building design, all of those sorts of things, uh, trans you know, the transportation system, the utilities. And so the standards um, just seem antiquated when they're compared to the things we have added to our code in the years since those provisions, since these sections were adopted. Uh, with, I said drive-in theaters was an exception. Um, not that anybody's really seeming to want to develop drive-in theaters anymore, but um, they, they are a service use. And so some of our, our zones presumably would permit a drive-in theater, but they're lumped in with all the other service commercial uses. Nowhere are they singled out. Nowhere does it say they're subject to Section 814, which means that that section of the code is just floating out there with no applicability. And so the proposal is to repeal it. Uh, again, with guest houses, so um, repealing the minimum lot size standards. So right now there are specific minimums, for example, in rural residential zones, I believe it's an acre. Um, and it, it, it's not really clear why that particular accessory use would require a minimum lot size. They all have to meet setbacks. They surely would have to avoid the septic system. In the urban area, we have lot coverage limits that regulate the total coverage of structures on a lot. So any other type of accessory structure, like an accessory dwelling unit or a garage, they all have to fall within the maximum lot coverage, which is typically 40% in our urban residential zones, single family residential zones. So the idea here is to treat guest houses the same as all of those other residential accessory structures rather than having a minimum lot size that's specific for those. Um, and then with regard to the kitchen provisions, right now uh, it says that a guest house can have a separate bathroom. It can have an, another sink in addition to the separate bathroom, but it cannot have cooking facilities or a refrigerator. And over the years, I guess staff has kind of come to the conclusion that people have refrigerators all kinds of places in their homes and outbuildings and garages. And we really don't want to be in the business of regulating refrigerators, which typically don't require any special permitting anyway. So we typically don't know, even know they're happening, which doesn't necessarily mean you don't want to prohibit it, but it's kind of another argument uh, for repealing that. The prohibition on cooking facilities would remain because that really is what makes something a kitchen or not a kitchen. And if we let them have a kitchen in the guest house, it becomes a dwelling and then we have problems because really it's an ADU at that point and in some zones that's fine and they can meet the ADU standards and do that. Regarding home occupations, um, so several changes to our home occupation standards, one of which you discussed at length at your study session. So the first issue deals with um, something that you know makes a lot of sense to people who do this every day but probably not a lot of sense to the general public wanting to um, permit something on their home. Um, there are lots of record, which under our code is sort of a separately saleable piece of property legally created that you could, you know, sell off, versus a tract, which is multiple lots of record 
that are contiguous and owned by the same person. So you could potentially have your home site. You might have two lots of record with one house because for whatever reason, you've just chosen all these years to, you know, to keep that together. You want a larger lot, you've got livestock on it or whatnot. And so um, right now, depending, we have three different sections of our code that deal with home occupations of different types, and they're not really consistent, but generally this question has come up about whether you could have the accessory structure with your home business in it, like a wood shop, for example, on the lot of record next door to the lot of record that has your house on it. As long as it's all one tract, it's all in the same ownership, the owner is living in the house and running his business out of the wood shop, Staff's conclusion was, we think that's okay. And so the language, we're proposing to change the language to make it clear. In some cases, it's clear that you can't do this. And in some places, it's not clear because the term used is vague. Um, but just to clarify that, yes, in fact, if you have a tract, you can have your home business anywhere on that tract as long as you're living in the home. We're proposing to adopt a definition of gross vehicle weight, which we are taking from the Oregon Vehicle Code right out of the Oregon Revised Statutes because we have limits on large vehicles in association with home occupations. And there's just been a little lack of clarity about what it means when we say 11,000 GVW. So now there would actually be a technical definition that links to the state um, vehicle code. And then the one that the commission talked about, the access standard for home occupation exceptions. And so we had public comment at your study session. Um, the way it works currently is that you can apply for a home occupation exception that's been in our code since 2002, where you say, you know, you've got these 12 or 15 standards that apply to my home business, and I wanna ask for an exception to one or more of those. There are some you can't ask for an exception to, but most of them you can. Uh, and it, it bumps up your review to a higher level. So instead of just having the staff make a decision and have that be appealable, it automatically goes to a hearing, kind of like a conditional use permit. There are discretionary standards, so we're sort of looking at the character of the area and the degree, you know, how big of an exception are you asking for? Is this appropriate here? Uh, it might be to have more customers coming to the property. It might be to, well, one of the common ones is for a larger accessory building space. And so we had a public comment from Mr. Reister at the last meeting about um, wanting the Planning Commission to consider allowing more people to have the potential to get an exception. So right now, you can only ask for an exception if your access is on a roadway that has a functional classification of collector or higher. So those are more major streets. If you're on a local road, which tend to be like our normal subdivision roads, um, or a private road where you know it's being maintained privately, you can't even ask for the exception. I mean, you can technically ask for it, but it would be denied just pretty much off the, off the top. Um, just one note on the private, when you are accessing on a private road for a home occupation, you have to get the permission of everybody else who shares that road because you're all maintaining it. So there's still a safeguard there that the neighbors do have a say in terms of the home business when it's on a private road. So the Planning Commission directed staff to draft an amendment indicating that anyone could apply for an exception regardless of the classification of road that their access is on. And so that's what's in your packet. In addition, you had asked about the possibility of maybe loosening the standards for the accessory building space just in general. And I don't think there was really a specific direction, but potentially that you would just sort of automatically allow more building space, or uh, right now when you ask for an exception, you're still capped at 3,000 square feet. So potentially to remove that or to increase the size. And so um, you had asked for some data um, I have, what, what happened, the reporting capability out of our computer was decent but not great. So there are some limitations for the data. As I mentioned, the exceptions have existed since 2002, the ability to do that. In looking at the dates here, I'm not sure we've got all of the ones from the first early years because we haven't always input things. Our computer system has changed and you know, you have to know, right, what you're asking for to get it to spit the right stuff out. So we did come up with um, 33 requests of which three were denied, and one is still pending because it's a very complicated one that was remanded, um, and it's not, I think it's kind of effectively void at this point. Of those 33, just by reviewing the report, I can tell you that at least 14 of those were specifically to ask for an exception to the accessory building space. Might be more than 14, but it's at least 14 of the 33. And of those 14, eight of them asked for the maximum, the 3,000 square feet. The other six, 
either it's not indicated here what they asked for or it was clearly a lesser amount, more than the normal requirement, but less than the 3,000. So there's not necessarily a pattern to what's being requested except to say that, a, I, th I think it's safe to say a disproportionate number of the exception requests are for that particular standard. That's clearly one that people are bumping up against and would like to have you know, more space. Um, I can certainly delve into these more. It's going to require actually probably pulling the files or at least pulling up the electronic decisions for all of these, and I simply you know, haven't had the time to, to spend. And so I think it's a question of whether the commission would like to continue to pursue that, to, get, you know, to have more information. We could potentially include that in, <coughs> potentially in a few, future phase of the audit, or I'm thinking more likely that it would be something that the commission could suggest for the work program that we're already gonna be starting to talk about in the fall for the following fiscal year, if you were interested in kind of pursuing that as, a, as an amendment to the home occupation standards. So I'll kind of move on unless you wanna talk about that right now. Yeah, why don't you move on, finish your staff report, and okay. then we'll come back to it in discussion. Okay. Cause right. it's, it's, there's a lot to think about there. Yeah, sounds great. <clears throat> okay, so I get to stop talking now and turn this over to uh, Martha Fritzi. Um, we are just sort of generally proposing changes to, to, our code has two sections that deal with solar access. One related to new lot design, like if you're doing a partition or a subdivision, and the other related to building permits for structures. Um, and there is a proposal to make substantial modifications to the one related to lot design and to repeal the one related to structures. We did talk about that. We've talked about that at, I think, at least two or maybe even three prior study sessions over the last couple of years. I know Commissioner Phillips had a couple of questions which we did attempt to respond to in the staff report. Um, and Martha will go into this in a little bit more detail now. Well, I don't have to say anything else now. Yes, you do. <laughs> I don't understand. You understand it all. <laughs> um, so I'll start with the one that I think is easier to explain the amendments to the solar access standards as they apply to new lots. Um, when you want to split your property, how you design your lots is subject to meeting certain standards that um, are intended to allow for more passive solar access light to come into all of the houses that are eventually built in, <clears throat> excuse me, in the subdivision. And so the proposal um, really substantially, it looks like it substantially amends that section. What it really is doing is cutting it down and, and hopefully making it easier to meet the standard and easier to apply for exceptions if you can't meet the standard. Um, currently, there's a standard that 80% that of the lots have to meet in your subdivision. Otherwise, you could apply for an exemption, a full exemption, a partial exemption, or an adjustment. And when you look at all of those things put together, they're all kind of just exceptions. Um, and we rolled all of that into meeting a standard or applying for an exception um, and tried to make it very clear how you would apply for an exception to that standard and what you would need to demonstrate in order to get that exception, while at the same time, reducing the number of lots that had to meet the standard up front from 80% to 70% in the hopes that um, most land divisions would just have to meet that and not have to deal with the exception. And the 70% uh, really came from um, the staff planner who processes the vast majority, if not all, of our land divisions and has for um, well over a decade. And it just better reflects what we're actually seeing out in the market. A lot of our lots that are being that are being divided are infill, and and it's hard unless you have a big rectangular shape, completely vacant, um, sort of horizontally presented lot. It's really hard to actually design it so more than 70% of your lots can meet the the standard to maximize the light for each of the each of the dwellings. And so um, as part of that, there's also a proposal to remove several of the definitions that were in that section. They're definitions that are no longer needed if Section 1018 is repealed. And that's the second bullet down on there, um, which, which applies to the solar access standards for individual building permits. Um, and before I get into that, even though the entire section is proposed for repeal, there is a chunk of that section that applies specifically to multifamily development um, that is not being repealed. 
it's being moved to section 1005 and it still um, reads the same and there's certain separation requirements based on the height and the orientation of your building that multifamily developments still need to meet. Um, again, with the hopes of maximizing for individual units in a multifamily development for maximizing the amount of sunlight, natural sunlight that they get. Um, the rest of 1018 is proposed for repeal because it is difficult. Um, it's, it, it includes standards that were adopted in 1989 based on model solar ordinances and haven't really changed substantively since then. It's difficult to administer. Um, it, it potentially conflicts with um, desires to promote infill. And quite frankly, when it, when it was, when it's administered, it was, it was basically applying discretionary standards to building permits without um, having a land use application. And it caused extra time, it caused extra expense, and in the end, everybody was allowed to build their house anyway, and sometimes it had to move a few feet in a, in a direction um, you know, to, to maximize the, the shading on the northern, or the lot to the north of it. And it's just, it's just impractical. And so staff has spent some time researching other jurisdictions. And interestingly, a lot of jurisdictions in Oregon have the exact same ordinance that we do um, because it's the model ordinance that came out in 1989. A lot of them have repealed their standards um, like we are proposing. And there are some other models of this type of ordinance that you can use um, that we have found, but nothing seems, there's no, there's no great way to do it, it seems. And particularly given the range of lot sizes um, and locations, and we've got urban lots and rural lots and a lot of infill lots, we have flag lots, it just there doesn't seem to be a good way to accomplish um, anything more than what what 1018 was ac was accomplishing or not accomplishing to begin with, and I guess as a final note, I would say that it's not even clear from 1018 what it's trying to protect. Um, it's not protecting a solar um, an investment on a solar array on rooftop. It's just simply protecting light coming onto another property. Um, and so I guess that's pretty much it for me about 1018. I just, we, we're, we're proposing that it be repealed. If something comes along um, that, is, that seems like a, a better means of trying to provide some additional protections, we would certainly be willing to take a look at it in, in the future. I have, a, <clears throat> I have a question about the passive solar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you, if you go from 80 to 70, uh, what do you think the, request for exceptions will, will it decrease down to be no requests or will it just become the new trying to get from 70 to 60 as far as so the percentage? Um, it's not going to decrease down to no uh, requests just simply because we have a lot of infill development and it's just simply not practical for some of the lots um, I don't I don't think that it's necessarily a game of developers to try to get more um, just to get more, if that if that's what you're implying that oh well I just want to get an exception from 70 to 60 now, um, we have tried to structure the exceptions so that it's clear that you have to demonstrate that there's some specific need in order to reduce it, and there's also a provision in there that you're only allowed to reduce it by the minimum amount necessary um, in order to mitigate whatever circumstance, be it slopes, or um, if, if meeting it re, um, requires you to reduce the number of lots, we're not going to make you do it. Um, you're allowed to maximize the number of lots allowed under zoning. Thank you. Yeah? I have another clarification question yes. on um, 1017, it mm -hmm. says reduce the basic design standard from three alternatives to one. Can you explain exactly where that is in 1017? 1018. The basic design standard. Yes. Okay. 
What do you? It looks like it was three bullets in ten seventeen oh three that just got combined into one bullet instead of three, but the staff report sounded like it was three different standards that got reduced to one. So I wasn't sure what it was implying. It's possible that I'm that it, that's an error on my part also, because I'm the one who created the bullet as opposed to Martha who created the draft. So it might have been just a, I might have just missed it. Do you have the right, this is the current one. Mm -hmm. So that goes away. Protected sword welding line. And then performance options are struck. Okay. So uh, Commissioner Phillips at the bottom, of, so section 1017, the bottom of 1017 five where 1017.03 is the design standard section. So currently there is A, which is the basic requirement. And then on the following page, there's B, which is shown as struck, the protected solar building line option. And then on page seven is C, which is the performance option. So the proposal strikes the protected solar building line option and the performance option and just leaves in place the basic requirement. So that's what I mean by mm -hmm. okay. reducing from three options to one. And were these uh, B and C struck for similar reasons as 1018 as they were just too difficult to administer or? Um, certainly the solar building line option was and the performance option, the alternative lot complies with. Yes, because it's also difficult to administer. I mean, it's talking about specific building designs when we're looking at lot divisions and orientation. Um, and so we tried to simplify it and make it um, things that we can administer through the lot division process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions with regard to the solar access? And then we'll let the staff finish up their report and then go back with questions of everything else. Does that make sense? So I just want to make sure, because this is kind of a technical area. Feel free to, and you, we, can, we can circle back if we need to, so. Is there a vegetation limit since we're going for solar? Uh, is there an amount of vegetation that we're going to try and reduce to allow solar to pass through if you're in a forested area perhaps or something of that nature? There's not on the lot itself. I suppose that's up to you. And um, there's, there's, really no, there's really no way to administer any specific vegetation height requirements if it's on the neighboring property. I mean, under state law, you are allowed to negotiate what's called a solar um, access easement mm -hmm. with someone on the neighboring property where they agree to vegetate the area, uh, you, know, to, you know, not let it grow to a certain height or, you know, whatever you're going to agree to in your easement. Um, but there's no way to mandate that on somebody else's property. And this will not address anything of that nature. There's no change to current. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so if we have more solar questions, feel free to ask them, but let's finish the staff report mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Perfect. Oops. Okay, so now we get to the part where I say, well, we have a few changes. Um, <laughs> so staff's recommendation, obviously, is to adopt the changes that we sent to you with a few edits. So we've been continuing, as you can imagine, with the size of the packet. Every time I go back and look at these things, I think, oh, wait, I, maybe I should change that, or oh, did I miss a conforming amendment here? And so we've been continuing since the staff report was drafted, since your packets were put together, to kind of do what I would call final quality control. Um, and I think we are at the point now where it's final quality control, with the exception that I still need to, do need to go back and check all the citations, which I always do at the, you know, before we adopt the final written version, those will all be checked, and I'm sure I'll still miss a couple, but. Um, so we, uh, this is a list of things that we would rec staff would recommend changes to the draft that we sent you in your packet. And I'm happy to, if you want to, I don't know the degree to which you want to follow along in your packets, whether you want to make notes, I can go as slowly as you want. I can leave this, you know, the slide up if there's things you want to talk about. 
I think for the most part, these are not, are unlikely to be um, of great significance. Um, and in at least one or two cases, it's really just a timing issue and we're wanting to hold off on something. Uh, so the first thing is, and I actually think maybe I skipped. Yeah, sorry, it's just too touchy. There we go. So this, um, I did try to put these up here in the order that the sections appear in your packet. So the first would be a change to section 202, which is the definitions section. Um, and I, after talking to code enforcement staff today, I decided that maybe we went a little too far with the edits to the, um, to the definition. And I do think we need to leave something a little more explicit in there regarding rental income. What it says now is that it can't be used for boarders or lodgers, which is a bit of an archaic term um, that, that I would recommend we change um, and use the same language that we use for our temporary dwellings for care. So it would say, a guest house shall not be a source of rental income. And so that sentence would just be added to the definition of, um, of guest house in lieu of what's there now, which is the borders or lodgers language. The second change is to section 711. The only changes being made in 711 are conforming or housekeeping edits. It's not really being, quote, audited as part of this package. That's actually scheduled for, I believe, the next phase. Um, but as part of cleanup, I concluded that I went too far and proposed to move a couple of conditional use criteria from one subsection of 711 to a different subsection in 711. And I've realized in rereading 711 that frankly, it's so confusing currently regarding which criteria apply to which uses that by moving it now, I may inadvertently be making a substantive change that is not intended. And so when Mike and I talked earlier today, we just said no. We just need to leave it where it is and deal with it when we audit the section over the upcoming year. So it's, it's no change to current. It's just a change to your draft. Right. Okay. So the third thing relates to our home occupation standards. And as I mentioned, we have three different sections of the code that deal with different, times, different types of home occupations, 806, 822, and 836. And what we have right now is a conflict in that there is a state standard that applies to all home occupation permits in our natural resource zones. It's a state mandated requirement in EFU, uh, exclusive farm use, timber, and ag forest districts, which talks about the kinds of buildings that you're allowed to use for a home occupation. It's in our code now. We also have a definition of home occupation in 202 that talks about the kinds of buildings that can be used for home occupations. And in a very narrow way, they conflict with each other. And yet they both apply right now. And so what staff is recommending is that we address it by essentially stating that in those natural resource zones where the state standard applies, that's what's going to apply. So in lieu of the provision that's in the definition. And so the provision that's in the definition will still continue to apply in all of the other zones where it currently applies. And it essentially requires that they be conducting the building, uh, conducting the home occupation in an accessory structure, and I'm paraphrasing, but that's just sort of generally what you would expect to see in that zone. So it could be in a barn, it could be in a detached garage, it could be in some sort of a hobby shop, but you're not gonna build 7-Eleven on your property and run a home occupation from it because that's not something that you would customarily have in that zone. So that in a nutshell, that's how that standard works. But the language is a little different in the natural resource districts because in those zones, uses aren't categorized the same way. And so we don't refer to, for example, to primary uses the way we do in other zones. So it's a very narrow um, conflict, but it is a conflict. And so um, I'm recommending that we just address that by saying in those three districts, EFU, Ag Forest, and TBR, the state standard will apply and everywhere else, they'll get the standard that we currently have in the definition. Um, the fourth bullet uh, is actually related to just moving something. So recyclable drop-off sites, which are basically those places where you can just kind of go and there's drop boxes to put different things in to recycle, um, are allowed through section 819. Um, and they are specifically allowed in about a half a dozen zoning districts um, as you know, just they're just allowed. But then in addition, in 819, it talks about how, oh, and by the way, you can also do these things in conjunction with a whole bunch of institutional uses, no matter what zone you're in. So you could have a recyclable drop-off site in conjunction with a school, in conjunction with a church, in conjunction with a government facility. And that 
piece I didn't move it where it needs to go. It needs to go into the tables of uses so that it's clear that you can continue to do those. It's not a change, it's being moved from 819 to the tables. And so I need to go and make that conforming amendment to, uh, to those tables. The next one we actually talked about, which is this idea of being able to conduct a home occupation on the same tract as the house as opposed to on the same exact <laughs> lot. And I caught that in two of the three home occupation sections and not the third one. So I need to make that change in 822 for consistency with, uh, with the other two sections. And then adding composting facilities as a prohibited use in all zones where it's not explicitly permitted. This is another situation where there is a prohibition on that use that's buried back in uh, section 834 that needs to be put into the tables um, so that it's clear that someone can't come in and argue they can maybe have a composting facility in some other cat in some other category for example trying to get creative when it's very clear that when the composting standards were adopted it was intended that they would only be permitted in some very specific zones and so that language would just be moved again just similar to the recyclable drop-off site provision uh, into the tables where all the uses are listed Whoops, keep, okay. The next one is a timing one. We would actually like to pull, to postpone consideration of the special process and standards for microcells in section 835. We would just simply remove all the references to those. Um, I do think it's a good idea. The staff person who's processing wireless telecommunication facility permits had a specific example where this came up and it seemed like the process they were required to go through was too cumbersome. And so we tried to put something in, but it just doesn't feel quite developed enough yet. We got a little rushed at the end and we're starting to ask ourselves questions like, well, what if they wanna do 10 of these on one building? What if they wanna have you know, 10 equipment shelters on the top? What if, and so uh, we think it needs a little more work before we would consider bringing it back for you. So it would just be, again, it's not a change to what's happening now, it's just let's not go there quite yet. We'll work on it a little bit more. Uh, the multi-use development sign standards. Um, I've been trying to consolidate all the sign standards in section 1010 and I caught several of them this round and I missed the one in section 1016 which is actually being renumbered to 844. So I just like to cut those, you know, no change, cut them right out of 1016 and drop them into 1010. And then the last two relate to the solar uh, discussion that you were just having with Martha. We need to retain the definition of undevelopable area that was shown as struck because we've realized that it actually does apply in um, a couple of circumstances. And a related reference to that definition that's in the definition of northern lot line. And then the reverse, we need to repeal the definition of south and south facing, assuming that we are going to repeal section 1018 because it will be an unused definition. The definitions for both sections are in, in 1017. So that's why there's that overlap. Um, and then with regard to the exception language in 1017 about existing shade, you can use, if you have existing trees that are shading a lot, you can use that as one way to get an exception to the solar design standard because the area is already being shaded, so there's really not benefit to creating the lot, I mean, that's the argument anyway, um, to making them meet the solar access standard for that lot. But there's nothing in there that clearly says they actually have to protect or preserve the trees once they use them as the basis for the exemption. It's implied, but it's not as clear as it should be. So the idea is if you're gonna use the trees to justify an exception, then you should have to pr protect and preserve them. Obviously, trees may die a natural death, but at least as far as you're not gonna go cut them all down um, right after we grant you the exception. So some clarifying language for that. And then just a note about the schedule. Um, obviously, you're having your hearing right now, and the Board of County Commissioners will hear this item on August 15th. And if they approve it, then um, the tentative effective date by the time we adopt the paperwork and wait for the appeal period would be October 1st. Okay. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to propose that we take some time for questions on anything not related to home occupation. <laughs> and then when we're done with those questions, Jennifer, I think it might be helpful if you could give all of us a quick, like, two-minute overview of what the caps are now, how the exceptions work. That way we're all on the same page and we can sure. have a real discussion about the exceptions and everything else. Sure. Does that sound great? So why don't we go ahead, any, any questions not related to home occupation? Um, who would like to start? Anyone? <laughs> Dive in. Mary? 
Uh, so my first question is on 821 Livestock. Um, there's a provision 82101, the new letter D, that um, prohibits the use uh, or the keeping of swine. And I wanted to know why pigs are not allowed, especially when horses and cows would be. Mm -hmm. You asked that question um, of me offline mm -hmm. after the last meeting. And I don't know because I was not around when 821 was adopted. So I did ask um, a couple of people who worked at the county a little longer than I have, the planning director and um, Rick McIntyre. And I, I don't think anybody had an exact answer to know what the thinking was when that provision was adopted. Um, there, the sort of theory anyway from Rick and I think maybe from Mike was this idea. I mean, I, I think at least I've heard that this idea that pigs are dirtier and smellier than the average livestock is sort of a myth. But I think... The thought was that that if they're not cared for properly and an area, you know, mud, et cetera, that they will get in it, that they will then potentially there would be a problem with smell or whatnot. And so that was probably the thinking. But other than that, it's just a theory. I, that, co that provision's been in our code for, I could go back and figure it out, but I would probably guess maybe even the 60s. Long time. Okay. Um, that's something that I would like to bring up as a possible change. I don't know if it's too substantial to do tonight, um, but I definitely think that pigs are no more of an impact than uh, cows and horses, especially if they have the same size limitations or something more appropriate to the size of the pig. Um, from all the farms that I've toured around here, the pigs are no more impactful than um, cows, horses, sheep, anything else. So Okay, so I do want to make one point of clarification. I don't think this changes your argument, but just so everybody does understand the way livestock works in our code. So the livestock provisions in 821 do not apply in zones that permit farm uses just in general, right? So if you're on an exclusive farm use property or an RFF5, which is rural residential five acre, you can have pigs. And we don't regulate it at all. None of these standards apply. But these standards in 821 apply as soon as you get to... Um, well, one of our two acre zones and then the one acre, like in Boring, Malino, the, the one acre zone and then the urban uh, residential zones. But you're right, cows and horses and goats are allowed in those districts, so. Yeah, I, I see no reason to exclude pigs. So I don't know if that's uh, more substantial than what we're looking at tonight, but that is something that I would right. like to see looked into and changed. Okay. Um, so Mary, I will make a note of that, and when we go into discussion, we'll pick that up. Okay. Um, I have a couple other sections that I have questions on. Just Should I go question on that? Or? So, is that in both? Uh, that would be in both RA one and RA two zones. Hmm. Right. Would be in all the zones that are subject to eight twenty one. Yes. Which yeah. is R ten, R seven. Yeah, in, yes. In addition to the urban ones, it's but that it would it's be RA one and RR. RR. Yes. Not RA two. Okay. They you. don't have, they're not subject. Yeah, right. Thank you. Um, should I Go continue ahead. down my list? Yeah, okay. Feel free. So the next section I have questions on that are not home occupations um, are 8244, uh, manufactured dwelling, 824.4. Okay. Um, my main question was really just the, when the code got combined for the, um, no, that's the wrong one. So my question on manufactured dwellings is 82402, the new letter A, there was a change between what we reviewed last time and what the proposed code is now. Um, it's no longer adding except as permitted by accessory dwelling units. Um, so at the bottom of page 824-1, is that because manufactured dwellings are not permitted as accessory structures and ADUs are dwellings is that why that was taken out of here it's because th at the moment these two code packages are being treated as though the other one doesn't exist mm -hmm. so they're both running on their trajectory and at this point we cannot assume that either one or both of them will be adopted and so what will happen is let's assume that the board at their hearing on the first approves the ADU language then whatever that final draft looks like and then whatever they approve for this will be synced up and essentially the, the plan right now is to adopt them both on the same day and they will be knit together at that point. Okay. 
Um, so basically that change would be running with the ADU code? Correct. Okay. Um, and then my other question, which might not be a change tonight, is um, A2403, uh, the last page basically requires manufactured dwellings to have a garage. Yes. Are stick-built uh, primary residences required to have a garage? No. Okay. So is there a reasoning for why the manufactured dwelling has to have a garage? Um, I don't know what the thinking was when the provision was adopted. Our proposal here for manufactured dwellings is to essentially clean up this section and to sync it with limitations on our authority under state law. But we were not proposing really any significant policy changes in terms of how to treat them beyond what we have to do. So in other words, we right now have some standards in here we can't have because they're preempted by the building code and we're not allowed to regulate differently than the building code. And we're, we're under state law, we are allowed to have very specific provisions that apply to mobile homes that don't apply or manufactured homes that don't apply to stick built. And so we've made sure our list is no more, you know, doesn't include anything we're not permitted to include. So my assumption would be that there were, at the time that these standards were adopted, there probably were some concerns about manufactured dwellings, whether it was aesthetically or property values, I don't know. Uh, it was, I was not working on the code at that time. And so they put in all of the standards that the state statute permits them to have, for, permits us to have for manufactured dwellings, but we're not required to have those. So if the commission wanted to relax the standards, that could be done. Um, I think we are, some of these things probably are gonna be beyond the scope of the notice, even though I realize we don't actually, you know, the public isn't really involved in this process. The bottom line is, yes, we did notify. It's all been publicly, you know, published and we've met all of our legal requirements and all the neighborhood associations have been notified. And so some of the things like that that could potentially have some public concern, I think we would be pushing it a little to try to do that now. It would be better to have it come back in a different package. Okay. Uh, one last question uh, on manufactured dwelling parks. Um, really just a clarification question. Looking at the setback standards, are there any uh, setback requirements between individual dwellings? Those are regulated by the building code. Okay. Yes, there's a manufactured dwelling park code, and all of those internal setbacks were precluded from regulating under zoning because they're done under the building code. Okay, great. Those are my questions. You get a gold star, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> are there other questions from the commission? I had a question. Louise? Um, it threw out quite a few of these. You indicate change reference from family daycare provider to family child care home for consistency with state law. Um, my question is, uh, why would any kind of daycare, child care, be in sections such as ag forest or timber? Those are exclusive use zoning that barely allow any kind of residence at all. So a daycare facility, no matter what you call it, shouldn't I wouldn't think even be in the zoning. So why is it throughout various other zonings? So a family, what was a family daycare provider that the state is now licensing, they've changed the names. It's the same thing, but it's just got a new name. So now they're called family child care homes. Um, those are permitted in single family dwellings. So essentially it's like a, you know, it's a home daycare. It's basically accessory to the dwelling. And local governments are not permitted to regulate or restrict those, they're allowed in a dwelling. So in an ag forest or timber or exclusive farm use, you're correct, it is difficult to qualify for a new dwelling, but there are a lot of dwellings that are pre-existing and there are people who can qualify today. And so if they have a legally existing dwelling, they can have, they can run a daycare out of that home as long as they're licensed by the state. So I uh, say a person running this daycare out of their home has some regulations as to like how many children can be there per square foot, et cetera, et cetera, versus a structure that's built as a business basically to be a daycare. So there, the regulate, I don't, I don't pretend to be an expert on all of the state's licensing requirements, but yes, they have different classifications of, of registering. Some of them are registered, some of them are certified, and they have certain standards they have to meet. Um, 
regarding, again, like I, it, they can have up to 16 children, including their own, in a family daycare. It used to be less than that, and they increased it from, I think it was 13 to 16 several years ago. Um, but there are requirements that pertain to like the staff that work there and outdoor play areas and things like that. I couldn't tell you exactly which standards apply to these, these family daycare ones are on sort of the the less regulated end of the spectrum relative to if you were a commercial daycare provider, but there are still standards and those are all contained in the state uh, statutes and administrative rules and are administered by the child, child care division, I think it's called, of the state of Oregon. So actually uh, the use of, you know, of someone's home for this is allowed by state law. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's correct. Thank yes. You. Any other questions? Telecommunication questions. Uh, as far as it relates to the Pico um, microcell uh, being delayed or recommendation yes. for it being delayed, th th that's not stopping the approval of permits to deploy the microcells. No, that's correct. Um, what we were trying to do was streamline the process. So we, um, the way our code is written, and the code was adopted, gosh, I, 20 years ago, roughly, um, maybe not quite, but and. It's really never been updated. And so, of course, the technology has changed. They're building fewer new towers, which is, I think we would probably all agree, probably a good thing aesthetically, right? These students are smaller. And, and yet our processes haven't changed. And so we still have a situation where in residential zones in particular, um, wireless telecommunication facilities, once you get beyond, well, even co-locations are somewhat regulated in those zones. But once you get beyond putting it on a utility pole, kind of in the right of way, or certain co-location proposals, you're just a conditional use permit in our residential districts. And I think the thinking was, these were gonna be these huge towers and were potentially gonna be pretty you know, disruptive potentially to neighborhoods and so they wanted a more you know, detailed review process. And now we're saying, well, some of these facilities really don't fit in that you know, that niche so much. And so the idea is to maybe come up with something simpler. But we started realizing we haven't thought about it enough. Um, and maybe we need to just make sure we don't go too far the other way because there should be some standards. And so that's why we'd like to bring it back. But they can still apply. It'd be a conditional use permit. And they've been doing that for 20 some years and we've been approving them for 20 some years. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions, Couple Christine? Random small questions. Mm -hmm. So drive-ins. Yes. I know nobody wants to do them anymore. So sad. So, <laughs> I know. So sad. <laughs> Clinging to the drive-in. So, but if someone does want to do a drive-in, and now yes. there's not standards that say you can't have the screen facing the highway or whatever, it's just a conditional use permit, and this can happen in what zones? And So it actually wouldn't be a conditional use permit. It would be a design review application okay. if this okay. were to happen. And off the top of my head, um, general commercial, Probably corridor commercial. So our most heavily commercial districts that permit every service use you could ever possibly have. Okay. Um, and there's nowhere is it called out as a drive-in, but there are some zones that talk about theaters, although it's not always clear whether they're talking about movie theaters or performing arts theaters. Um, but generally there are catch-all service categories and I can find it for you, but there it would be commercial zones only. Okay. Certainly not residential, not out in the you know EFU land or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't change the issue that there would be things we would have to review. Um, I think we would still, you know, I'm not really worried about the traffic issues because we have pretty good um, tools for dealing with you know safety and how the access works and queuing and you know do you blow the transportation system out because you've got cars lined up down McLaughlin for two hours before the movie starts. I think all that could be adequately dealt with. Um, you really, there is a, there are some standards in general commercial that do talk about what is it, it's like noise and, I mean, there's, there is some sort of an impact standard in our general commercial district at least that could potentially be used to deal with the question of is the audio too loud or that kind of thing. But in terms of screen orientation, I mean, the best I can come up with is there are, I, I think personally, we have standards that talk about screening um, from sort of dissimilar uses, you know, so I think you would be able to make a pretty good case, for instance, that orienting the drive-in screen toward the neighborhood would be a disruptive and how would they really be able to screen that, you know, unless they had, so I think we have some tools, but we, don't, we would not have anything as specific as what is in 814. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the alternative is to apply those standards 
right? To people who aren't applying. <laughs> to, yeah, right. Um, and we would need to basically change, <laughs> instead of repealing it, we would change the code to say these standards do apply in these circumstances. Um, and it isn't that we couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. I think that would probably be something where we would have to notify, which, you know, yeah. we certainly could. But yeah, it won't be quite as, it won't fit quite so neatly into as it and would. We won't if, have like a Newburgh drive in on Highway 99E or McLaughlin or whatever anytime soon. I mean, somebody could apply on McLaughlin. Okay. But I'm I just saying. don't, I think there would be some siding challenges. But I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I got gotcha. you. My last question is <laughs> much easier and much shorter. <laughs> And that is um, the section on landfills. Yes. There was a reference to um, Metro and how Metro regulates and all that kind of stuff. So it implied that all landfills are within Metro boundaries. Mm -hmm. So right. what happens to the landfills that aren't in Metro boundaries for the standards that are being? DEQ. Oh, it's okay. So it's still covered. Yes. There's still regulations. And the other thing is that we would have a conditional use process, oh. which would be robust and could result in and automatically looks at things like noise and traffic and odor and dust and mm -hmm. all of those things. So in the event that we ever actually had one, I think we're well, well prepared to address the impacts. And this is actually my last one. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you were mentioning guest houses and uh, the addition on this last slide about rental income. Yes. So is that in, in the definition somewhere that uh, very specifically uh, makes it clear that that covers like Airbnb, like not like monthly rentals, but overnight lodging. So that's included, inclusive of that in a way that's very clear. I think so because it says um, it will say it already. And this is not a just to be clear, not a change exactly. It's just slightly different language to say the same thing in a more modern. What I think is a slightly more modern way and more consistent with the rest of our code. It says that what what a guest house can who a guest house can be used by. So members of the family residing in the dwelling, um, they're non-paying guests, and they're on-site employees. So I don't think any of those things encompass Airbnb. And then on top of that, I'm saying just to be absolutely clear, let's go ahead and say it can't be a source of rental income. So I think we I think we will have all our bases covered with regard to that. Yes. Thank you. I did have one. And, and that was uh, on government camp as yeah. being a resident at one time. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. I see nothing uh, in your open areas or buffer areas on uh, snow storage, which is a pretty big issue since they're yeah. clearing roads. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it's past, the homes are built, but there's very little area to, stow, to store snow right. through the winter. So and you're suggesting that might be an appropriate use of those open space areas. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So I'll make a note of that because we really aren't auditing that section right now, but we're going to. Okay. Um, so I'll just note that. And then when we come back, we can talk about it some more. Yeah. And another section, and that was on the, uh, back here on setbacks. Mm -hmm. And this was a minimum setback uh, for the sides of 10 feet. Now, many of the homes are 35 feet tall, 12-12 mm -hmm. pitch, right. may have 30 foot of slope per roof. And when it cuts loose, it's covering more than it's 10 feet. And if you have two homes together doing this, you have an area that is going to have 30 feet of snow mm -hmm. stacked up, if not more, and perhaps take out windows of the house next door. So you're talking about the, like the snow slide area. From, exactly. Right. Yeah. So I'm not sure which section exactly you were looking at. Um, so 711 deals with the government camp open space district where there aren't dwellings or not a use that you can have. Okay. But our other government camp zones, um, which would be the Hoodland Residential Zone, the Mountain Recreational Resort Zone, and also the commercial zone, the Rural Tourist Commercial Zone, all have provisions that deal with snow slide. Um, those have been in there for many years. I can't promise you they're the latest and greatest technical analysis, but they require if the, if the roofs have contiguous snow slide areas. So if one roof is sloping this way and the neighbors is sloping this way, then there's not a concern. But where they're sloping toward each other, they are required to be separated by 20 feet. So, you know, like you say, that's a 10 foot setback on each, it creates a 20 foot gap. That may not be enough, but mm -hmm. that is what the current standard is and has been for many years. We did have some discussions with, um, uh, I think it was an architect that does a lot of work up in government camp, and I wasn't the one that was having those discussions, but I think the sort of general report out was that it wasn't really clear what a 
better standard would be. You know, there are apparently new roofing systems that maybe can deal with these issues, you know, and yes, there better. Is. And, yeah, no and so we were sort of not sure what to replace it with. And so we just opted to, we didn't want to repeal it. We had thought about repealing it, and then we thought, no, that's not a good plan. So we left it in, but we haven't sort of fixed it. So if you have thoughts on that, be happy yeah, to absolutely. look at that. <laughs> yes. I'd just like to compliment staff on your memory for knowing those setbacks based on slope off the top of your head. <laughs> Thank you. So much more. It, it tells you that I spend way too much time with this. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so we had a, some t public testimony at the last hearing around home, home occupation, and there's basically two questions that we need to answer, right? One is uh, whether to remove the exception that staff has included in their report, and the other piece is whether to do anything about the existing cap. And so I was hoping, Jennifer, could you give us kind of a lay of the land about how everything works, and then we'll close the public session, then we can have a robust discussion about that sure. when everybody's on the same page? Sure. Thanks. Okay, so in this case, although I mentioned there are three different sections of the code that deal with different, different types of home occupations, the only one in play for this is section 822. So if you want to follow along, that's where it is. This is our general home occupation section. The other two we have are for very specific, you know, narrow types of home occupations that are special. Um, but everybody else goes through this regular 822. And, you know, I... I I can go into as much detail as you want, but you said two minutes, and I've probably never explained anything in two minutes in my entire yeah, life. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> so, um, Michael, Ish. yeah, Michael laughed. But I think it's important for um, everybody to understand how the process so and there, works. And there's a copy in your package. Yes. So you may want to refer to that as you, so as the, you go along. Yes. So the standards, and it, it's I realize it, with all the struck and whatever, it gets harder to follow. That's why I asked you to explain yes. it. Yes. <laughs> so there are three levels of home occupations currently. Level one, they don't even need a permit from the county. This is so minimal, nobody's, you know, you're running a home office because you, whatever, or a Mary Kay lady or a, you know, I mean, what that kind of a thing, right? You're an insurance broker who sells online and you just have a computer in your office. You do not need a home occupation permit from the county when you're at that low of a level of business, okay? Then, or that least impactful, you could be having a great business, but you're not causing impacts on your neighbors. Then there are two, sec two separate types of level of major home occupations, level two and level three. The proposal here is to consolidate those standards a little bit better instead of having so much repetition so that you'll see that a bunch of the standards are the same, whether you're a level two or a level three. And then there are about four or five standards that a level three is allowed to have more impact than a level two. And the distinction there is the lot sizes around you. So if most of the lots around you are more than two acres in size, you may have a level three. Otherwise, so that the reality of that is that most people in the urban area are gonna have a level two and not be able to go up to a level three because the lots won't be big enough around them. In the rural area, a lot of people will qualify for level three, but not always, because we know there's small home sites out there and it sort of depends if you're in a subdivision of one acre lots, then you know, you're gonna be a level two. That does impact several standards. It definitely impacts the size of accessory building you can have for your home business. So it's 500 square feet for a level two, and it's 1,500 square feet for a level three. And those standards have been in place since 2002. Also in 2002, we adopted these exception provisions that said, hey, if you're willing to go through a public hearing process and demonstrate that you meet some discretionary standards, because our home occupation standards are not discretionary, meaning you meet them or you don't. It's X number of trips per day, it's X number of employees, it's noise that doesn't exceed X decibels at the property line. These, are thing, these things we can prove one way or the other, whether you meet the standard or you don't. Whereas discretionary standards, well, somebody might think it's in keeping with the character of the area and somebody else might not. So there's some discretion involved in deciding whether you meet the standards. So those standards for the exception appear on page. Bottom of page 822-11 is where it starts. And you'll see that the very first thing that's shown as struck is the requirement that in order to have an exception, you have to take direct vehicular access to a road with a functional classification of collector, et cetera. So it's collector and everything above that, major and minor arterials, highways, et cetera. 
And that's the language I struck based upon your direction at your study session. Then on page 12 are the actual standards then that apply, the discretionary standards. So it talks about compatibility with the area, and then there's a list of factors that are considered in determining whether compatibility has been maintained. Then there's a, excuse me, a standard about services are adequate. So we're looking at transportation and public facilities, things that we normally would not look at for a, a regular home occupation, so traffic generation. Um, and then there are some things you can't have an exception to. And in some cases, that's because the state won't allow it in, an, in a natural resource zone. And we've also, as you can see, capped um, under C2, the accessory building floor space cannot exceed 3,000 square feet. So even if you get an exception, there's still a cap to that standard, 3,000. So I think the policy questions that are on the table, the first one was, is it appropriate to allow anyone to apply for an exception, even if they're on a local road or a private road? Um, or, and the third one would be connectors. There are not a lot of connectors, but that is another classification that's below a collector. So private, local, or connector. And then the second thing is, is there some desire to just generally revisit the idea of how much accessory building space is appropriate for a home-based business? And you did say there were still provisions protecting the other users of the private road. Correct. Outside of what was proposed yes, for there is an Yes, there's a petition required. They have to sign the first time somebody gets a home business. Once they get it the first time, they can continue to renew it without, because the theory being you've established your business, you're in, you know, as long as you're meeting the, the continue to meet the standards, you can stay. Notwithstanding the home occupation, what's the cap on an accessory building? Does that make Just sense? in general. Mm -hmm. um, typically, there isn't one. So in rural areas, there are um, no maximum size standards for accessory structures. As long as you meet, you know, building codes can change. If the buildings get big enough, they're, the code does change. Setbacks might be different under the building code based upon the size, or you may have to do a firewall. There's some things that kick in, but if they're agriculturally, well, they wouldn't be for a home business, so never mind. Um, so no, no cap, and there's no law coverage standard in the rural areas. So essentially, you just meet the setbacks, and you can't put it on top of your drain field, and you're done. You could have, you know, <coughs> 25 greenhouses on your property, and that's fine, and they could all be 10,000 square feet. If that's as, what you as long as you're not op operating a business inside of it, w at which point you would have to wall off 3,000 square feet in order to have your And your another business. clarifying point to make is that you potentially could be running a business inside it as long as it's a farming or forestry related business. Because we do treat commercial agriculture and commercial forestry differently in most of our rural zoning districts than we do other types of businesses under a home occupation permit. You can farm on your RF5 property, and it's commercial farming, and you can do that outright. There's no review by the county for that, so, right. so it's different. In the urban area, um, there are some restrictions on accessory building size. It depends on the zone. But really, the combination of there's typically a lot coverage limit. So most of our urban low density, like our, 10, our R10 or R7, 10,000 square foot, 7,000 square foot lots, it's a 40% cap. So by the time you start thinking about, well, I've got a dwelling, and I've got my attached garage, and I've got my tool shed out back, and now I want to build a building for my home occupation, you know, a lot of lots aren't really going to be able to fit something that's huge. But they potentially could, and then, you know, if they happen to have a larger lot, they could, and then there are some limits still based upon the size of the house and, you know, sort of some scale things regarding the size of the accessory building and the size of the dwelling and height and all that. So it's much more restricted in the urban area. Other questions, then we're going to close the session, then we'll come back for discussion. Steve? So in 822, uh, page 3, the letter D for interference, uh -huh. uh, electrical interference, there's a international standards that deals with light for beaconing for Internet of Things. So when you talk about interference, uh, you, we all know that Wi-Fi extends beyond our property lines, which is not visible light, but there is a new Internet of Things standards coming out for beaconing, we can't see the blinking, but it will be blinking, so it will be a, a light that can be seen. So are we going to be flexible in the letter D to allow communications to take place? I have absolutely no idea. How do you like it? You've stumped me completely. Um, so that does not happen very often. Yeah, <laughs> FC, FCC, FCC part 15, like, so we have to accept interference from Wi-Fi. Uh, we, uh, there's, we can't say we. We can't. We, we 
own the right to it. We're preempted, is right. what right by okay. So mm -hmm. with the Internet of Things, the the standard these lights that we have illuminating us now would be flickering so fast we wouldn't see it, but that's how we're going to get to the next uh, step of faster speeds. Okay, so your concern is that potentially that that I would be I'd be able to argue that my neighbor can't can't do that because it would violate this light, interference visible standard. Light, visible okay, light. so. Um, I guess what I can tell you is this. If that were to be an issue, and we, I mean, at the moment, I can tell you I don't have the technical expertise to, to know how that fits with this standard. But if we're preempted by the FCC, we would honor that. We don't, I mean, just routinely. There are certain things where we know it doesn't really matter what our code says. Right. There are certain things that the federal government can, you know, Excuse mandate, and this doesn't overwrite that. And so we're very conscious of that. But by the same token, if there's something that should be done to this standard in the future, because this one, I, that probably hasn't been touched in 30 years, you know. So all kinds of changes have happened since that was written, and we certainly be receptive to something that might better capture what we're trying to prevent. It's coming, so it, yeah. it, it yeah. doesn't have to be addressed now. <laughs> okay. Any other questions on the staff report? Okay, so we're going to revert back to the script real quick. Um, have we received any correspondence on the matter that is not in our packet? No. <laughs> no. Uh, additional reports from government agencies. There's obviously no one here. I don't see anything coming. At this point, we would usually accept public testimony, but there's nobody in the room. Uh, and then I think we can officially close the public hearing and move into discussion. So, so why don't we do this? Um, Let's um, go. Uh, let's have everybody just kind of, kind of, let everybody know kind of where you are in the process. Mm -hmm. I've definitely heard pigs are an issue, and we need to have a conversation about that. And we need to have a conversation about the home occupation standards in particular. So aside from that, you know, if folks would kind of just say, are are there any other things that you really want to focus on to discuss any concerns you're having, and that will help us figure out how to proceed. Uh, and I won't put our new folks on the spot. So why don't we start with Mary and Christine? Uh, I think I heard two other items that weren't necessarily part of tonight, but that we might want to put on a separate, can staff look into this for us? Okay. Um, for maybe future ZDO changes, uh, audit changes. And those were the garage requirements for manufactured dwellings, and then the snow storage use in open spaces in government camp. And I think those are, can we ask staff to look into that items, not for tonight's hearing. I'm, I'm seeing Jennifer nod yes. Yes, that I, have, will yes. I have both of those notes. And um, clearly the government camp open space section will be coming back to you sometime in the next year based on our work program. I'm, I'm actually kind of thinking on the fly here, but I'm wondering, um, I think there's a, we have something on our work program just generally for housing. And it's because the county is doing a task force about housing affordability and homelessness, and we're going to be hopefully doing a housing needs analysis. And I foresee that there will be a package of housing-related amendments that would be coming to the Planning Commission. I don't know when. It's possible it could happen in 2019. But whether that's the early part of 2019, I don't know exactly. But I'm thinking that could be a natural fit for that because we would be looking at sort of barriers to affordable housing. And I think this idea of requiring the garage could fall pretty squarely within that category. And so I might just sort of keep that kind of as a in mind for that. And then if it seems like that isn't developing, we could also look for another place to, to put that. That sounds good to me for those. Great. Thank you. I would kind of tend to want to put pigs in that same kind of category just from my perspective. It seems like it's such an interesting thing to have been excluded. It makes me wonder if at some point there wasn't public testimony on concerns around those little fellas. And I think it would be really interesting to have an opportunity, again, maybe not tonight because there's no one here, to uh, make sure people know we're talking about adding pigs back to some list in case there's community concerns. I mean, we've obviously had people have concerns about roosters and all manner of other neighborhood issues. And so, I don't know. I don't know why it's not on the list, but I'd be curious to hear from the public if we were thinking about putting it back on. Is there anything that that would be a natural fit for coming up? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't, no, not necessarily. Or a, uh, 
Um, unnatural fit. Yeah, an unnatural <laughs> fit. Um, I mean, I, th I think we could sort of put it in the audit parking lot, I guess. Um, there are kind of these random things that are sort of still on Jennifer's master list that never seems to get any smaller no matter how many times we come and do this. And so it's possible that we could just sort of decide to do something about it. Um, I can definitely look at, um, I can look a little bit more into the history. Yeah. So I'm just, I just think it's been in there forever, but maybe it hasn't. I mean, maybe it was added. I mean, we do sometimes find that, right, that there was a livestock section put in in 1960, and then in 1974 they added pigs because there, and if that's the case, we'll have a file on it. So I at least can look for that, which would give you kind of that context that you're looking for, um, and that would be a place to start. And otherwise, I think it's really just a matter of deciding, I mean, that it's pretty straightforward. You allow them or you don't. That part's pretty clear, but what do you want to do as far as the size, right? We have some size standards for different types of livestock, so we would need to decide which category we're putting that into. And then I would feel better if we included it in a notification to the neighborhood groups because I think for the reasons Christine is saying, right, wrong, or indifferent, there could be some strong feelings about that. And so I think it would be better if we, it's, it's a loosening of restrictions, so we don't have to do individual property owner notice, but I think we probably should do an, a neighbor notification. So um, why don't I bring you back some background, and then if you're still interested in pursuing it, we could just add it with, a with the next audit package. I think that's fine. Okay. It seemed like I recall we had an issue with roosters at one of our meetings. Last meeting, yeah. <laughs> non non yes. yeah. Existing non-conforming roosters. Yeah. Existing non roosters. <laughs> um, I can say <laughs> that I will be interested in it coming back for okay. sure, um, but okay. having some background on it would be very helpful. Okay. Um, my initial inclination tonight for how they're regulated would be to put them in with um, uh, horses and cows and the other li large livestock, large okay. um, but with additional information, they might be a smaller size requirement than horses and cows, uh, depending, but I would be very comfortable with my experience to put them in with the larger for now without additional information. Okay. I, I was just brainstorming on that idea. It could be a water quality issue, especially if you have, mm. so many. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, a fairly large head count, um, you know, because they are very destructive and erosive uh, because of their rooting. Mm -hmm. um, with that mud, you know, in a urban setting, it obviously wouldn't work. Uh, goats are pretty destructive too. Yes, they'll they eat anything. Be, absolutely. And goats get out. <laughs> yes. Um, I can tell you that if it's regulated like other livestock, it'll be limited based on area, so that right. would be less of a concern. And often with um, pig keeping, they actually get nose rings to okay. uh, yeah. deter that activity. Hmm. But aren't aren't the zones that are usually standard residential restrict? Livestock, in other words, aren't we talking about the zoning where livestock normally would be already? I mean, you don't see horses and cows and pigs and goats in, you know, single family, you know, neighborhoods. So I'm just confused as to, you know, because you, you said earlier there was zoning where it was just exclusive farm use. So anything goes when it comes to livestock. So what zoning are we talking about here where it's like in between the big farms and regular urban usage? Yeah, can you describe which zone districts 821 mm -hmm. applies to? Yeah. Sure. So, um, so yes, 821 actually really kind of is an urban standard. Um, I mean, it spills over a little beyond urban to um, kind of small lot rural. So we actually are pretty, um, I think, probably by regional standards, fairly permissive in terms, I mean, I haven't done a survey recently, but as far as the type of livestock that the county allows in its urban area, I think less restrictive than you would find a lot of cities are. And I don't, you know, I think that's probably just because historically, it, you know, we were more rural and as that's changed, those standards have just stayed in place. So it actually applies in all of our urban low density residential zones. So that's, you know, 10,000 square foot lots, 7,000 square foot lots. Yeah, we're talking about subdivisions, right? But the reality of it is that because of the size limitations, mm -hmm. you would really have to have for most, not all, but for most of the livestock, and certainly for the large livestock we're talking about, have to have an oversized lot mm -hmm. in order to, I think it's 25,000 square feet per large Cows animal. and horses, 25,000 square right. feet. So you wouldn't still half an acre or, or correct. More, so, so while you would be zoned R10, 
for instance, your lot would be oversized. So um, it does require them to be on a larger lot, but it does mean that your neighbors might be 10,000 square foot subdivision lots or 7,000 square foot subdivision lots. I mean, you are talking about, you know, some potential conflicts. And so I think that's why, you know, we do have the restrictions that we have. Mm -hmm. And then it also applies in our one acre zone, um, which is a more rural, you find that in our, in certain unincorporated communities like Boring and Molino and Colton. And in the two acre zone, that's up near Mount Hood. So it does kind of go all the way up to a two acre zone in some cases and all the way down to 5,000 square foot lots. But I again. can see this, like in some of the legacy farms that they've sold off everything surrounding what they've decided to keep for themselves and you know maintain some livestock for themselves and they're surrounded by smaller, Correct. smaller lots. I can yes. see that happening. Yes. Okay, so what I'm hearing is, Mary, you're okay kind of postponing this for more information, and we'll come back to the... Yeah, if we can get more yeah. information and put it with the the next discussion and the next CDO audit item, that would be that would be fine, as long okay. as it could keeps that, moving. Could that include, you know, like surrounding counties as far as what they've done to understand examples of uh, what is being done? Because I'm also sitting here thinking, you know, the setbacks for buildings are, you know, 10 feet, but if if I had a... 25,000 square foot lot, I think I could be putting a, the mud pit at the property line. And so I don't know, and I just need to learn more of sure. what could people come and say, no, we don't want this, or yes, we're okay with this. Sure. Yes. Michael, do you have thoughts? On, on the pigs? Uh, gen <laughs> generally, uh, I'm, I'm getting back to our, uh, just checking in with everybody where you are on the ZDO. <laughs> well, I heard some discussion on this um, occupa um, occupation stuff, and it seemed like we discussed something uh, several meetings back about a guy that had landscaping over on Stafford Road, and we made some comments on that. Does anybody recall that? Mm -hmm. And I five and Stanford Road. That was reversed Road. by the that board the of county change. commissioners because he was requesting his own change. That was his yeah, own change. How does your changes fit into that? What we allowed him to do. We didn't. The board of county. So I don't think that was a home business. Is that correct? No, it wasn't. It a home. wouldn't apply to him. It was not a home occupation. Yeah, no, that was he wanted to do a use that wasn't permitted. So we're definitely come back to for discussion on the home occupation piece. Uh, I guess what I'm looking for are any other issues with the staff proposal that folks are concerned about, want to want to raise. I, I'm getting a sense that generally everybody's kind of on board with where we are. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I don't want to cut off Steve and Louise and Gerald. Any anything you, you feel free to jump in. Anytime. When can you ask like a general question? Just you know, it's fairly general. Yes. Well, my, it's an odd question, but we did have two members of the public here earlier, and then they left. Is there any reason why they left? I'm just curious if anyone knows. You know, they, they have a piece of property, um, and there was some issues around ADUs and things like that. And I think they were instructed to come and listen. And I thought I informed them that actually we had the ADU discussion or Last meeting week. or two going to, go to the board. And so I actually um, got some information from them. I told them I'd follow up on where they were in the ADU stuff going to the board. Um, I think August 1 or whatever. So it was really not related to this. So, so they I'm actually yeah. sort of had come by accident. Yes. Okay. And I'm following up with them to try and answer their questions relative to that. I think all the stuff that's going on, it's, they have a, an alleged or pending violation, and I think all the ADU stuff will solve that or potentially solve that. Okay, thank you. Good eyes. <laughs> Okay, so I'm cognizant that we've been here an hour and a half. Would folks like a like five minute break? Yeah, I, I'm seeing, so let's take a five minute break and we'll okay. come back and we'll tackle the home home occupation stuff. So let's come on back. So I'm as we discussed before the break, I'm I'm hearing a general consensus that everyone is kind of on the same page here, uh, except that we need to kind of have a conversation about the home occupation stuff. Um, so at the last. Our, at our work session, we heard some public testimony. Uh, everyone was on the same page with the idea of uh, removing this exception for the the, the roads exception. Mm -hmm. The girls. Everyone's still there. Yeah. Any, everyone comfortable with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the only question then we have is whether 
and I, the reason I bring it up because we kind of promised at least to have a conversation about this at the last meeting. So the question is, you know, right now the home occupation requirement is capped at 500 square feet. Um, there's a maximum you can appeal and get up to 3,000, but you can basically build an accessory unit of any size as long as you don't have a, a, home, a home occupation inside of it. So the question is whether we want to contemplate raising that cap and we could propose something tonight. We could decide to do a little more research and sit on that. Uh, I guess I would look both to Jennifer to see if you have any recommendation one way or the other or if anyone feels strongly about how to proceed here. Um, so just clarification, you're right, 500 square feet for the level two, it is 1,500 for the level three, Three. so just to be clear. So a lot of the more rural, you know, again, if you're on, if the lots around you are larger than two acres, then you're going to be able to qualify for the 1,500 square feet. You can use a larger building, you just have to wall it off, so it does require them to partition it, which is, you know, obviously a a barrier to, to, you know, to it. Um, I think, you know, I'm comfortable with you sort of, if you decide that you want to make a change, that you just sort of include that in your recommendation, but I will be circling back with our council because there's, oh, there's just this gray area about how much we can change after we've notified. It's clear you make changes along the way, and that always happens with a legislative proposal. But at some point, have you, you know, have you gone too far off the topic? And clearly we're making other changes to the home occupation provisions. We're talking about removing the exception language. This may be fine. <clears throat> if they advise that we, you know, that that we shouldn't proceed, then that's what we'll tell the board. And then we would circle back to you at a later point. But I think since, since this discussion seems to kind of be ready, you know, you seem to be ready to have it. Um, if you are, just, just go ahead and make the recommendation and then we'll kind of figure out the procedural path so, after. Or- Clarifying Go ahead, question. So, so clarifying question. So it's 25% or 500 square feet, whichever is the le- less. Is that correct? So that's the four, incidental. Four yeah. So an unrelated but confusing standard um, or a related. But yeah, that's the incidental use provision. Okay. So you can have for a, um, for a level one right. home occupation, which these are the ones that don't have permits required, you can use... of an accessory building or 500 square feet, whichever is less, Less. for storage only. So it's more restrictive than what's... um, than what's going on with these level two and three home occupations. So I think level what- Level two is up to 1,500. Level feet. two is 500 just flat, okay. and level three is 1,500. Okay. And then through an exception to either a level two or a level three, you could go as high as 3,000 if you're approved through this discretionary process. And, and what was the intent of those limits? So, um, you know, full disclosure, I did not participate in, I, I wasn't on the team that did that particular amendment package. Um, I did work for the county at the time. You know, in general, the idea behind all of our home occupation standards is to limit the scope to something that's appropriate in a residential setting. Now, not every home occupation is in what you would consider a typical residential setting, you could have a home occupation on a 70 acre timber piece out in the middle of, you know, other 70 acre timber pieces. But a lot of these home-based businesses are happening in neighborhoods. You know, they're happening on local roads with, um, you know, 10 other subdivision homes. And I think the idea was that the sort of cumulative effect of all of the different impacts might get to the point where it's just too big to be in that setting. And so, I think they tried to kind of get at that. And this goes all the way back to, I think 1981 was the county's first home occupation code. And then it was substantially amended. It's been substantially amended a couple times since. And it's all about the impacts. So it's traffic and it's noise and it's odor and it's, you know, the number of employees and all of that. And so building size, I think, was construed to be probably one way of limiting the overall impact. You're right. With the idea that once you get up, if you really need 3,000 square feet, you should be looking at some commercial space or whatnot and not locating your business in a residential And And I suppose, I mean, I I don't know how compelling I find this argument exactly, but there could be the argument that if you're allowed to have that much space, then there's the, it's available and there's this greater incentive to just sort of grow into it, right? So that maybe you're starting to violate some of the other standards, you know, it's just getting too big for the site. 
I think the uh, sort of the problem with that argument is that we will allow you to use part of a building. So you could have a 10,000 square foot accessory building and you have to partition off 1,500 square feet. There's really nothing that, you know, right? You could still have the same sort of creep. So in the end, it's still, still up to the folks to follow the rules and it's still up to us to enforce where we need to. So there was no, nothing in there about the type of business that you were conducting, um, just right. it was a business. Correct. Yes. The, the home occupation standards don't talk much about specific types of businesses. There are a few uses that are just prohibited, but it's a very, it's very few. Um, and those are the ones that were construed to just have too many impacts to be able to really address adequately. But otherwise, it, it's wide open. The home occupation seems to be home-based businesses, basically, or running a business out of your home. Uh, historically, in many zones, I would think, in across the United States, residential and business are always kept apart. And uh, what's the history around, it was it when more people started running small businesses out of their home, like Mary Kay? Do you know what the history around that permitted use came about? Because they always they say it was pretty separate. You know, you don't run your business out of your home. It's not allowed. Yeah, I mean, I think zoning has kind of gone in, right? It's the pendulum swings one way and then it swings back. And it used to have a lot of, um, probably a, a lot of mixed use in neighborhoods, right? The neighborhood grocery store. And, you know, and then we really got away from that. And things became much more segregated where you wanted your suburban, you know, subdivision. And then your commercial was someplace. And then we've started to swing back. Um, so I don't know, I don't know that I would trace our home occupation standards to any particular trend in that regard. I think um, my, my guess would be that the reason we adopted the standards in the first place was as a reaction to complaints. Home-based businesses do generate a fair number of complaints to code enforcement you know, because the neighbors aren't happy about the impacts. And so again, I'm get, I, I don't know because the first standards are from 1981 um, and we would have those records, but I, I'm not familiar with them. So I think it was probably a reaction to complaints. And then again, that as time has gone on and as complaints have continued, they've gone back and tried to sort of tweak it. And then the flip side is sometimes we've relaxed things because there's been a feeling that we're being too, so it's, we're, I think we've been really trying to strike that balance between Minimizing the impacts on neighbors, but allowing for, you know, sort of incubation of some businesses. And in some cases, it's not just incubation. That's going to be where they'll be always, you know. But The terminology home occupation, to me, just is a little bit odd. It would, do you know where that, could we clarify that? Um, why it's called that? Yes. Mm, I, I doubt I would have that information. I mean, I could certainly look. Um, but I think it just, it, it's to denote the fact that you can't have one of these unless you have a dwelling on the property and unless the operator of the home occupation is living in the dwelling. So it's not like, you know, I couldn't lease my barn out to Martha to run her home-based business. It, it's got to be the person who lives there. And I think that's intended to, I mean, if I had to guess, I would say because if you're the one living there, then it's your home that has to deal with the impacts as well, right? So there's a little bit of a check on maybe how intense that's going to grow because your family's living there also. It's your neighborhood and your neighbors. And so I think, I think that's the idea behind the name. And I, think I, and I think a lot of it is, I think the impetus was probably incubator businesses, right? I mean, you see some of these that actually start up. It's a way to start my business. I bring the cost down. All of a sudden, it's successful, and we have in, we have instances where they grow and grow and grow, and at some point, either they say, "Now I need a bigger space," and we have some industrial parks out in the rural area in our rural cities, and like we've actually seen some of these businesses grow, become very successful. Sometimes they're violations, and they end up finding better places to grow. And mm -hmm. so I think it's a lot of that. It's these incubator businesses, and I think more and more. Um, probably in the last 10 or 15 years, the ability to work at home and these computers and phones, and right. I don't have to go to the workplace. So I think it's all of those. The, um, and historically, the, this locational standard to do this exception on these higher classifications was just that. It was testimony originally when we were substantially amending the home occupation ordinance. It's like, why can't you do more if I'm on Sunnyside Road? It's a collector or it's an arterial or minor arterial. Tons of traffic. Why 
should there not be sort of this accommodation to to have some more impact where it's already a very very busy road um the 3,000 square foot limitation it's don't know where the standard <laughs> came from but i think it does get to the point and i i don't have a magic number um, but i do think it gets to the point where the idea these things are supposed to be accessory and inc incidental to the residential use of the property and so <laughs> some point how big is too big um that's it's sort of like the ADU question, why 700 square feet or 800 square feet or 900 square feet? I can't really answer it, but it is intended to be something that's incidental accessory, and they're both trying to limit the impact because it is an area primarily that's intended for residential use. Do we have that many exceptions to go up to 3,000 square feet? Well, that was the... Well, that, that was, I was actually going to point that out in the data, right? So there were there are 33 requests, 14 asked for an exception, eight of them asked for the full 3,000. What's not clear is whether they were asking for the 3,000 because they needed the 3,000 or they were asking for the 3,000 because it was the maximum and you just asked for right. the maximum, you don't right? Know that. I was right. hoping that the data would show us something yeah. about the numbers, but it clearly yeah. doesn't. Well, so. and I can dig into the... It, dig into it more. I mean, to get better information, this is just what I can glean from the report that the permitting software will spit out. It's incomplete. I mean, you know, to really know for sure, I, it's going to require reviewing all those files. That being said, I would make the argument, I know Christine has a question too, but I, I, I want to make the argument that I think we're, the point is to limit the impacts and make sure it's incidental and not having an impact on the residential area. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the square footage is necessarily the best way to measure that. Now we can't we can't solve that problem tonight, but you know we get back to back in the 80s, 90s. You're right; it was probably set up because there were incubator businesses. But if you read, you, know, you follow business type stuff, like you know, this is the new trend, right? Businesses are moving away from these physical locations, mm -hmm. encouraging, the, encouraging employees to work <laughs> from home. It's more and more. You know, we're entering kind of a new age where people are starting to do this more frequently. And I think it, it begs us to kind of look at these home occupation standards yeah. and figure out, is there a better way to do that? I don't think we can do that tonight, but I think it's something that should be on our plate. And I, and I would agree, right? So a 5,000 square foot building that's used, used to store materials, right? And generally a warehousing type of use right. may have very no little impact. or no impacts than a 3,000 square foot building that's used for auto repair and 25 cars coming and going, right? right? And that's, the, that's kind of the disconnect, and, right. and I agree with that. And so to some degree, <coughs> it can, you know, this exception can do that to some degree because it requires a public hearing, then it allows you right. to do those sort of impacts. Um, but, I think, but I think at some point there's a cap there. I, 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 that just, like... Well, and the question is, what is it? What makes the most sense? Building? Right. You know, at right. some point, it just seems like nah, it's not a hallmark anymore. It's it's a warehouse and industrial manufacturing use. But I don't know what that number is. Yeah, but, I agree. But I would agree. There's not the size of the building does not determine the impact. Yeah. It's one part. At it least might alone. Be, it might right. be visual. It might be those sort of things. But right. there's a disconnect in that. No, case in point, Hewlett Packard started in a garage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah, Some of it would be so, now. <laughs> so let's jump to Christine because she's been trying to jump in. Then Gerald. Uh, okay, go ahead. I'm just, I'm just waiting patiently. So I have a, just a couple things. Thank you so much for educating uh, me on this. As we had the gentleman who came and provided public testimony, and you, thank you for doing the research on this issue. For people who are at level two, just to clarify, when they meet the existing, when they can right now seek an exception. Um, among those eight folks, do they jump from the ability to have the 500 square feet or meet up to the 3,000, or do they have to go to the 1,500? They can jump. They can request a maximum of 3,000, and they can do that. And yeah, it can. They could ask for anything in between as part of the exception process, and then it's just a question of whether they meet the criteria. And I suppose there could be a finding made that well, we think 1,500 is reasonable, and 3,000 is too big on this. I mean, I, I I'm not aware of that ever happening, mm -hmm. but it could. As part of that process, they could give them something less. And among those eight, you don't know how many of those were level two seeking a jump to the three thousand, or level three from the fifteen hundred seeking a jump to the three thousand. Correct. I don't. Yeah. I can find again. I can find all of that out. Yeah. If you want more research, I can definitely do that. And so, in the case of the person who brought this issue up for us and started this whole conversation, I mean, obviously, his impact uh, wasn't going to change based on size. 
for him. Like he needed square footage to be able to allow his cabinets that he was in the process of building to be scooched aside so he could continue working on the cabinets alone as a solo manufacturer of high-end cabinetry. Mm -hmm. And so for his purposes, this really would allow his business to have been more stable and just, it just access to this exception process was really all he was asking for from us. And it just brought up this larger question of size. But, um, but, I, but I don't think that uh, being responsive to his concern, please give me access to the exception process because this is the kind of business I've had for the last 20 years and I just need more square footage, um, should necessarily move us to reevaluate these caps. So I appreciate that right now the proposal is to just line out the portion that would have prevented him from even having access to being reviewed and being allowed to seek an exception. Jennifer? You said that data that you had was like 10 years old, or, or is it? Um, it goes, the earliest one, I think, is 2006 on this report. Um, the exception process has been in place since 2002, which is why, oh, I guess we have one from 2004. I'm just speculating that we might have missed some of the early ones in the way the report printed, but. So within the last two years, do you, oh. did, how, how many did you have within the last two years? Well, it would really help if this report were in numerical order, but it's not uh. by year. I can tell you if you go on to something else and give me a minute. <laughs> well, I think on the same subject that you were talking about, you also have to consider if it's a cabinet shop and he's expanding, he's also producing hazardous material. He's producing spray. He needs a spray booth. Um, he's producing sawdust. He's also producing traffic. So. Should there be a zoning change? I mean, he's almost close to be being in an industrial zone. I um, think questions like these are exactly why we want to have the exceptions process yeah. and why we, right. we might not want to actually increase the size because that's an easy way to trigger looking at the impacts from what we can't predict otherwise. Because right. we don't know that just because he builds the cabinets that he also paints them. And, you know, I mean, he's been, you know, doing this work in this location for 20 years, and I don't think coming to us and asking if he can have access to the exception process should flag everything else about his business for review. Um, but I hear, I see where you're going, and I do think that that's, that's the whole point. That's what the exception process is for, for them to go through that, those issues. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so to res I, can I respond to Commissioner ahead. Wilson's uh -huh. question? Um, so there have been four applications in the last two years. Two of them were clearly for an exception to the accessory building space, and two I don't know. I would have to dig in because the report doesn't tell me specifically what they were for. So it's not high volume, yeah. you know. Um, I don't, I mean, I would assume by striking the limitation, you're going to increase the volume some because people will be eligible who on those lower classification roads. So we'll have some increase, but I, I can't, I don't know how many. And personally, I wouldn't want to, open up the size question without additional notification either, since it's mm -hmm. something that would impact the neighbors, we would like notification on that. So I'm hearing on the whole occupation that, you know, everyone's okay with removing the restriction. This, these people would still need to go through the exception process in order to get an increase, but we're gonna keep the, the 3,000 cap for now. Uh, and at some point in the future, maybe we can explore a different approach to home occupation. I don't know when that would come up, but it doesn't seem like we're ready to make any any other decisions right now. Sound right? Any other questions or concerns about the ZDO? If not, I think I'll make a motion. We'll have, we have a motion to approve. Uh, any other questions or concerns? So, Mary, do you want to go ahead and make a motion? Yeah, I would move that we approve file ZDO 268 as proposed in the staff report and with the changes noted by staff in their recommendation at the end of their presentation tonight. I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Second by Michael. Second. And Gerald. Is there any other discussion that we need to have? All right. With that, we'll go ahead and move to voting. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Excellent. We got through that. <laughs> so uh, I, I would propose we now we can actually have some introductions among ourselves, unless the staff have anything they want to add do, beforehand. Do we need to do minutes There's first? A, some other business and calendar, but I think now would be a good time. Sounds great. So we'll do I, introductions, then we'll approve minutes, and then we can have any staff updates and we'll conclude. Um, 
So why don't we just go through, I think it would be beneficial for all of us to get to know each other a little bit. So maybe try and keep it to a minute or two and just kind of give us a little background about who you are, where you're from, what you do in life, what motivates you to be on the commission. Anyone feel compelled to start? I uh, guess I can Louise. start since I'm at the end. Um, well, I'm born back east, so I'm not an Oregonian, but I have lived here the majority of my life. I've lived in Clackamas County 27 years. Um, I worked my career for the state of Oregon, and I'm retired for quite a few years. Um, right now, in addition to this uh, position, I serve on the County Parks Advisory Board. That's the South County, not the North, because I know there's two County Parks Advisory Boards. Um, and I also do a lot of other things, a lot of activism. Um, what else do you want to know? <laughs> Whatever you'd like to share. That's great. Gosh, um, I don't really have anything else, in, like say, unless you have any questions <laughs> okay. for me. <laughs> I'll, I'll prompt you a little bit. We just uh, part of the um, in the interviews, you talked a little bit in your interest in where you live and how big your property is and your zoning and your small wood lot. So okay. can you talk a little bit about your property? Sure. Um, I live on, it's almost 74 acres of timberland. I'm zoned TBR. I used to be in a GTD. I was a 40-acre zone when I purchased the property, and now it's an 80-acre zone. So I think I'm grandfathered into the 40, but it doesn't matter because I'm obviously not divisible because I don't have 80. Um, I, you know, I, so I followed zoning from the purchase of that property. I divided my property for the purposes of lending only. So I have two tax lots, um, but it's not legally divisible. I wrote my own legal for that lending purpose. So that was my, you know, just diving in head first is doing my own planning and zoning, shall we say. And that's, of course, 27 years ago. Um, so I have a little bit of background in that and learned about the different zones and what's allowed on them. Uh, my zoning is obviously um, allows a dwelling and a person to live in the dwelling only because that person is caring for the growing timber. That's the like the official wording of the zoning. So that's why I was asking things about daycare use because I was told that it's pretty exclusive use, as are some of the other farm uses where you have requirements on what you can do and what you can't do. Um, in my general area, you want to call it a neighborhood because everybody's on large property, um, people do have home-based businesses of all types and sizes, but I always got the general impression that kind of out there in the wilderness, we can kind of just do whatever and you know, compared to a, a regular residential community where things are very tightly restricted. So I have a little bit of interest in, in zoning and usages, and that's why... I applied for this commission. Welcome. Thank you. Steve. I'm uh, Stephen. I live in Happy Valley. I have four children. One's grown and married and lives in Florida. And my youngest daughter we adopted is 10. That's my boss. Um, <laughs> I sold my companies uh, last year. I uh, volunteer primarily. I'm on the board for North Lackland School District. Uh, I do some international telecommunications volunteering, so I am aware of telecommunications. It's IEEE 802.15.7 for light emitted. Um, you know, I, I, I've been very fortunate, and people have helped me out when I was young, and so I turn around and volunteer. It's my turn to give back. Um, I, Since I governed my companies, I approached uh, some publicly traded companies, and I shoot classroom curriculum, so I go around the planet shooting video for students so that they can see places they otherwise would not get. Uh, my mother doesn't inherently like it all the time because I walk across frozen lakes uh, with a lot of <laughs> equipment on my back. Amazing. And, uh, and next month I'm shooting in a ghost town in Southern California, or oh. Central California. That's incredible. Very cool. And I like being here. Nice. I, I really do it for, this is how I heat my house in the winters. Is <laughs> all the meetings I go to, I just collect everything. But, but it's $49 because I can't accept over $50. So. My name is Michael Wilson. I'm um, originally from uh, New Orleans. I moved up here in oh, 1996. Um, graduated from LSU with a degree in engineering. Uh, went into the Marine Corps, spent 20 years in the Marine Corps. And then I went into um, shipbuilding. Got a job up here with Gunderson and um, retired 2006 and uh, on this commission. I'm also on the Extended Law Enforcement District Advisory Board with the Sheriff and I also work with the Transportation Safety Commission too. 
Cool. Well, I guess it's my turn. Um, so my name is Brian Pasco. I have been on this commission since 2012. Um, so I grew up east of Cleveland, and I've most recently moved back to Bo uh, to Oregon. I live in Boring, Oregon, and we moved here in 2008. Uh, so for the last couple of years, I have had the great privilege of uh, being a stay-at-home dad to my th now almost three-year-old, as well as I run my own business, I'm a professional photographer. In a far previous life, I'm a recovering lawyer. Um, I, I went, to, <laughs> so I've come full circle. Uh, so I, I went to law school at Lewis and Clark um, uh, and practiced. I was an environmental litigator for a number of years, uh, and then ran my own practice for a period of time, doing everything from personal injury to wills and trusts, whatever came in the door. Uh, and then I ended up working for a uh, nonprofit conservation organization called the Sierra Club. Some of you are probably familiar. I was living in Minneapolis at the time. Um, I was their lobbyist in Minnesota for quite a while, uh, and then uh, moved back to Oregon, where I was the director of the Oregon chapter for almost eight years. Uh, so, and then uh, today I am. Uh, I also serve on the. I'm actually on the board of a. a the Lewis and Clark Montessori Charter School, oh, yeah. so uh, which has been a, I have to admit, before I had my daughter, I didn't give a second thought to the educational system in this country and that everything changed. So it's been a really great experience to be there as well. So uh, so those are some of the things that keep me busy. So, Mary? Uh, so I've been on the Planning Commission for just about a year now, somewhere around there. Um, before that, I was on the Historic Review Board. Um, I, in my professional life, am a city planner for the city of Gresham, which is probably why you'll note all my technical notes on <laughs> the ZDO audit. Um, before that, I was in Colorado working for a private planning company at focusing on historic preservation and uh, communities of distinct character. Um, and codes for them uh, when so that's my day job is planning and then my husband and I also have a small farm just north of Oregon City um, we're on EFU at 16 acres we're weekend warrior farmers still sort of trying to get it up and running so my husband can retire to farming in a few years um, so hence my interest in the pigs <laughs> um, and a brand new mom, right? Uh, second time new, brand new mom, yes. And so speaking of wild animals, <laughs> I have uh, my bosses are a two-year-old and a two-month-old right now. Nice. Best job ever. Yes. Uh, I live on South End in a rural reserve on two acres that can neither be farming nor expanded into housing. What is, what is South so End? we just mow. <laughs> Where is South End? South End. South End is, it's actually not too far from here, so um, it connects to 99E, and it is parallel with 99E, so if there's ever an accident on 99E between Canby and Oregon City, South right End connects. <laughs> so that's where we're at. Yeah, and so God bless Rural Reserve. So our, our neighborhood will never change, and it will never be anything other than, uh, what do they call it, excess land. <laughs> so, um, and I have three kids. I have a uh, soon-to-be junior, soon-to-be senior, a freshman and a sixth grader, and my kids traveled this year. My son just got back from Germany nice. for three week, three week uh, little trip there, and then my other son got back from South Korea prior to that. And the family right now is hiking backwoods in Yellowstone, and I am here with you guys. Um, in my I'm sorry, I know, right? <clears throat> I had to be here anyway. I had to work. <laughs> I'm an executive director for a nonprofit that lobbies for Oregon arts and culture, and I'm running for the legislature. That's wow. my deal. Gerald. Gerald Murphy, or Murph. Murph. Uh, where to begin? 46 years ago, I was sitting on a porch uh, with a friend of mine. I was 15, and we were looking at a uh, National Geographic and came across a spread of Ramona Falls and said, we're going there. We lived in L.A. So I didn't tell my mom where I was going. I just told her I was going to the mountains. And we hitchhiked <laughs> up to Mount Hood and uh, spent a night in Paradise Park and uh, saw Ramona Falls, and I swore I was going to come back and uh, graduated story. high school and, and came back, uh, went, moved to government camp, and boy, what an education from L.A. to government camp. Um, I went and got into uh, timber falling. I was a timber cutter for a number of years. Uh, 
went through the Endangered Species Act, uh, spotted owl issues, uh, Mount St. Helens, uh, uh, eventually got bored with it and stepped out of it and uh, got became interested in manufacturing, uh, ran a manufacturing plant in Sandy, uh, building truck tops for a number of years. Uh, got some background on that. Um, did a little legal consulting uh, after that on uh, product failures. Uh, from then, uh, became a general contractor, worked in my neighborhood, just uh, which is Timberline Rim, uh, in the Brightwood area, just east of Brightwood, uh, rhododendron address. Uh, I don't see much representation from that area here. That's why I'm here. And I got to know people after the 2011 flood of Clackamas County. Uh, I started designing uh, riverbank stabilization projects. Um, and this was kind of on a, a dare, so to speak, from the guy I work with now, my es excavation company that I work with. He said, if you can design and permit, we'll build it. And so I had to learn a new language and learn the whole process, and that meant contacting many people in this building and the one across uh, and becoming very familiar with the science behind it and the language, uh, enough to where the uh, Sandy River Basin Watershed Council had asked me to join them, and I'm still a board member with the Sandy River Watershed Council, and I am still very active in uh, taking care of my neighborhood, so to speak. We're working on a resiliency plan uh, with emergency management of Clackamas County, and I'm a representative for this, my area on that. And that's why I'm very interested in the planning on what's coming down the chute in the future. I want to make sure that my neighborhood is safe and my friends are safe, and there's an awful lot of development going on up there, and we'd like to see it done right. So I'd like to see um, low-income housing or affordable housing take place. Uh, there's a lot of people that work up there that can't afford to live in the particular area, and that's an issue right now, and I'd like to have a say-so in it if I can help it. So, 43 years ago, did you tell your mom you were moving to Oregon? Yes, I did. I did tell her that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I got her blessing. Yeah. So. Well, thanks to all of you. I, you know, I, I, we obviously have a very diverse crew here with a lot of backgrounds, which I think um, says a lot for what we can do. You know, I, I think from time to time, we all struggle with, well, what's our real job here at the end of the day? And I, I think the answer is that, you know, it's, it's about all of us with our diverse backgrounds coming together and trying to reach a consensus in order to help the staff make the best possible recommendations to the, the county commission we can. Uh, so thank you all for your service in doing that. Uh, uh, Mike, do you have, do you want to, You've been, you, you know everyone here quite well. <laughs> Does the staff want to offer any other feedback, introductions, anything before we move on to approval of the minutes? <laughs> no, I don't think okay. so. Perfect. Yeah, that was helpful, though, some Great. context. Awesome. Uh, so we have minutes in front of us. Uh, I know that Mary has one suggested change. Yeah. Can I mention that? So the first page, item number three, the end of the first paragraph uh, it says staff is recommending that there be an owner occupancy requirement. I believe staff was recommending that there not be an owner occupancy requirement. But other than that, the minutes looked good to me. No, go ahead. That's I'm true. Are you asking me? Yes. yes. <laughs> Okay, where was so, that again? Uh, uh, last sentence of the third paragraph. Yeah. So, Chair Pasco, we are reviewing the, min the bylaws right now because I think uh -oh. a, having a quorum to approve the minutes. I was just about to bring that up. That so, I was going to bring that up. But Robert's Rules has a provision because there wouldn't be enough people for a quorum, mm -hmm. but there's a provision in Robert's that says that if there is needed for people who would abstain because we weren't aware of the minutes, we are allowed to vote to make it so there is a quorum. So we need a quarum of people who are present? That's is that what you're saying? saying. The people who, at the meeting. The people who would abstain who are not part of the process. Um, but there's a provision to allow. So your suggestion to is to postpone? What's that? Is your suggestion to postpone approval of the minutes? Um, so hang on one, just one second. 
So it's a little, I don't think it speaks to the exact circumstance. So there's a provision in the minutes that says any commissioner not present at a meeting must abstain from voting on approval of the minutes. Yeah. So obviously we have three abstentions. Was everybody else here? The other four of you? Yeah. We have four of the five who are at the meeting. Okay. The and so, and then, it's a and then you can't take an at, you can't do anything at the meeting if you except adjourn if you don't have a quorum, yeah. which you do have a quorum. Right. And then I think it says that you need to have a majority of the quorum present. So I'm thinking, yep. arguably it's okay because there's we four of you. So I, I think we have a quorum of those who were at that meeting. I, I think it's okay. I think that's right. Are you looking at nine? Are you looking at nine C, Jan? I thought there was a provision in there. They had to have yeah, five yeah. positive votes. Five, a minimum of yes, five. Yes, majority of the quorum minutes, in yeah. attendance. Yep. So yeah. I think it's okay. Okay. Yep. So Sorry. So there were okay. five votes. Okay. So we are, the consensus is that we can move forward and approve the minutes. Are there any other changes? For those of you who are here, is there a second to Mary's motion? I second it. Second by Michael. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Aye. aye. I assume there are three of you who would like to abstain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and motion carries. Did you get all those abstentions? Okay, Darcy. Gotcha. I'm just, just looking out for you. <laughs> uh, and then uh, schedule review. Any other yeah. business? Up, update on schedule review. Uh, the August 27th hearing on some transportation system plan amendments has been moved to September 10th. Excellent. So there is our two regular meetings in August are the 13th and the 27th. August 13th is canceled. We have no agenda items. I would like to reserve August 27th, even though the public hearing is being moved to the 10th. I'd like to reserve August 27th for study session, informational, or whatever, tentatively. And we'll let you know at least two weeks ahead of time if we will keep that or cancel it. But if you would keep that on your calendar, I would appreciate a bit. It, again, it wouldn't be a hearing. It would be informational, some study session, maybe an opportunity for training, some things like that. So what you're saying is we're going to have possibly one meeting in August? Yes. Okay. Yes, and it would be the 27th. And then September 10th is the public hearing. We have some other hearings scheduled. Marijuana. No, that's out. Nothing's okay. finalized yet. There's okay. a tentative date, but. Yep. So that's what we have for the Planning Commission, Board of County Commissioners on August 1 is the uh, hearing, public hearing for their accessory dwelling units. Uh, and August 15th is the public hearing for this package that you heard today. And then September 19th is a tentative hearing for the TSP amendments, which is Th August 27th moving to September 10th. That day will probably move. move also. That, that one's going to move. Which one's going to move? Yeah. It doesn't matter. But Probably the one on September 19th will shift because it's too close to the date that your hearing is moving to. Yeah. I do feel like I should chime in here, though, and point out, because he may not, that if the training session doesn't happen on the 27th, then this would be the planning director's last planning commission Aww. hearing before Aww. he retires. So Object. I feel like we ought to at least have that on the record Aww. because possibly this is it. We're going to force him to come back. <laughs> you got to have one He's last having a retirement away. party, which I'm sure you'll all hear about. <laughs> yeah, you are going to make, one of you will make sure that we're aware of the party. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much for all of your years of service, Mike. It's, it's been, thank you. You've been great to work with. So. We'll chat before then. Yeah. Good deal. <laughs> All right. Well, if there's nothing else, we will go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you all very much. Have a great night.